In this session, we're going to talk about communication uh, and how it affects culture and how it affects uh, relationships. And so um, I have a, uh, a diagram for you. You can see it on this screen. It's also behind me. Um, and on the paper that you have in front of you, you'll see these seven uh, phrases or words. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of an assignment. But if you're watching this, I'd like for you to copy this uh, diagram down for yourself as well as these and then follow the same instructions that I'm going to give the people here in this room because it will be very important that you do this as well and it will help you in understanding the basic communication pro process. All right then, um, what you see here is a a basic communication model that is in most of our communication textbooks, but we're going to look at it a little bit more deeply than normally we get into in the textbooks because it can be so very important for us to understand and to realize where miscommunication happens, how we misunderstand people, and what we can do to better um, communicate with people so that there won't be the misunderstanding. Now there are seven phrases or words up here, speaker, hearer, message, frame of reference, desired action, result in action, and feedback. And on your sheet of paper there are also seven spaces, four on your left hand side and three spaces on your right hand side. All right, are we all clear so far? Good. Now what I want you to do is write uh, in each space the word that you think fits in that space. So each space will have one word and you'll use each of these seven items only one time. So no duplication or uh, no leaving one blank. All right? So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to do that. When, you're f when you think you've finished and when you think you've got them correct, then I want you to talk to your neighbor and compare with your neighbor your answers and your neighbor's answers and see if you agree. If not, then explain why you wrote what you wrote. Hear the other person explain why they wrote what they wrote. See if you can come to some agreement. All right? Okay, about one more minute to finish if you agree or disagree. Doesn't matter, we'll sort it out. Okay. All right, let's, let's take it one step at a time. We'll start here because this is quite easy. What did you write in here? Speaker, everybody agree? Okay, if this is a speaker, then what did you put over here? All right, good. Now, a little bit more difficult. Uh, what would this be? Message. Message, actually not too hard. And this one? Frame of reference, good. And the solid circle? Result in action. Everybody agree? And then the last one should also be easy since it's, well, not quite the last one, but uh, desired action, yeah. So this is sort of what was in somebody's mind. That's why it's a dotted circle. I don't know if that's, if you do the same in Russian as we do in Okay, that's correct. And this last one? Feedback. feedback. What does feedback mean? Response. Response, reaction, something, information coming back to you. Okay. Feedback was actually a communications term, a technological term, where it, it peel off part of the signal 
feed it back in to strengthen the signal, send it out again so more people can hear eventually, essentially, I think it was radio that used it first. Okay, uh, this, is our, this is our primary way in which I think virtually everybody communicates. So we have the speaker, which is the, the source of the message. or the source of communication. We have the uh, message itself, which is the source of our intentions. That is what we intended to communicate, what we wanted somebody to do or to, to hear or to respond to. And down here, in frame of reference, this is the source of our assumptions. So all of our assumptions are grounded in our frame of reference. Most of the time, our assumptions are not articulated. They're not spoken until they come out in a sentence somehow. Um, so the monkey, for example, in the monkey and the fish story, was assuming that the fish needed help. That was an assumption he was making from his frame of reference. Being a monkey, he liked dry land, he didn't like the water, so he was assuming that the fish was like himself. That was an assumption. And based on that assumption, we had that situation, that problem that came up. So we have the source of assumptions here in frame of reference. And in the interpreter, in the hearer, we have the source of interpretation. So this frame of reference shapes how the message is sent. But this frame of reference shapes how the message is heard. And unless both of them start here, there's a good chance there could be miscommunication because this is their shared frame of reference. All right, we'll come back to that in a little bit. This is the, uh, often, most often, it's a source of frustration. because what happens may not be the same as what we were expecting. So here is the source of expectations. Where do our expectations come from? From our assumptions. From our assumptions. Where does this result in action, this reality, come from? from the other frame of reference, exactly. So this starts to be a, an interweaving of our reality. We see how one piece influences another piece. So this heavily influences this, which influences this, all because of a certain frame of reference. This is, uh, influences how we shape the message, what we say, how we say it, when we say it, and it also shapes our expectations. Then we make the assumption that what we have here in our mind when we send the message is the same as what the hearer will have in mind, and they will do what we wish, but in fact, oftentimes, it's not the case. Okay. We'll do more and more of this as we get deeper and deeper. Feedback is a source of change. If these two circles are the same, then everything went smoothly, everything went correctly, everything was nice, and um, all our expectations were fulfilled, pleasant situation. But when the 
two are quite different, then we have frustration because what happened wasn't what we were expecting. And that frustration comes back to us and it's either the source of change or sometimes it could also be the source of um, resistance. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Uh, now, to make sure that we're kind of understanding this, I want you to uh, use some different words. Well, let me tell you a story first. The, uh, the story is a true story with, uh, between my wife and myself. We were on our honeymoon. We had been married, and now we were settling in to a little cottage that someone had given us. And she said, uh, tomorrow morning, I'd like to make your favorite breakfast. What would be your favorite breakfast? And so I said, well, that's easy. It's eggs, bacon, and toast. So the next morning, the noises are proper, and pretty soon the aroma comes through, and that seems good. And then she says, um, your breakfast is ready. Come and get it. So out in the kitchen was a little table, only about this size, and everything was dished up. She found a little candle um, on the table, either a candle or, t or a flower is usually on the center of the table. It was winter time, so no flowers. And she had dished up her, and she was sitting here. So she, um, when I came into the room, I noticed there was this expectancy in her eyes but I wasn't quite sure how to interpret that, and so I sat down and I said, well, let's bow our heads and give thanks for the food. And as I bowed my head, I didn't close my eyes quickly enough, and I says, oh, what, what's this? Well, you guys are doing it too. Well, you're making me feel, okay, all right, all right. So I said, what's this? She says, that's your eggs, bacon, and toast. And I said, what did you do to the eggs? And she says, well, I, 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 uh, I poached your eggs. Why? I says, you poached the eggs. Why would anybody do such an immoral thing to an egg? Now at this point, I was ready for a reasoned, rational, calm discussion on the art of cooking eggs. My wife wasn't interested in any of that stuff. She actually got up from the table and left. Now the expectancy was gone from her eyes and the tears were coming. And some of you are laughing at me, but your, your time is coming, I tell you. All right, now, I told you something about my wife's background. Where did she grow up? Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. What do you know about the history of the country of Zimbabwe? Anything? Nothing. Nothing? Mm -hmm. Do you remember who its colonial ruler was? Uh, not France, actually. It's Great Britain. Great Britain, yeah. They were an English-speaking country. Some of the surrounding countries were colonized by France and also Portugal. So just immediately to the east was Mozambique, which is Portuguese. And then immediately, not immediately to the west, but fairly close to the west would be um, what they called, um, well, well, Congo and places like that are French-speaking. But this was the British that had colonized it. And then her mother was also Canadian, so she was also quite influenced by the crown, as we say, the, by Great Britain. Uh, my background, my, uh, one of my grandparents was born in Switzerland and came uh, to America then as a young, young girl, quite young girl, I think six or seven. But um, my other grandparent was uh, born shortly after by Swiss immigrants coming to America. And so I have a very strong Swiss heritage. Now, um, with that information, I want you to go back to your charts, and I want you to fill in the blanks again, only using this, this information. So my name, Muriel's name. Let me get the information correct here. Ah. Eggs, 
bacon toast, okay. That will have a place in one of these lines. Uh, fried eggs, poached eggs, British, and Swiss. All right? So using the same uh, lines now, these same seven lines, I want you to fill those in with these words, and we'll put more flesh to the story. All right? It shouldn't take you so long to do this, because you already know much of it. Everybody finished? Okay, let's fill these in. Speaker? Mm -hmm. And uh, the message? Eggs, bacon, and toast. Yep, that's what I asked for. Uh, bacon. All right, that was the message. Um, she asked me what I would like, so I gave her the message. So the hearer would be Muriel, my wife. And what was my frame of reference? Swiss, exactly. And what was her frame of reference? Now, what do you know about the British at breakfast time? I'll tell you, they do silly things. Very silly things at breakfast time. They do the strangest things with eggs you've ever seen. They, they crack them open and they barely get them warm, but they're still flowing around in the pan, and then they dump them on your plate, and they call that an egg. Now, the Swiss, they know how to cook eggs. By the way, <laughs> most people don't know why the American Revolution happened. Poached eggs. After a while, you just get tired of these silly things, and you go off somewhere else. So a bunch of us went off to America to start the new, the new world over there and cook eggs the Swiss way. That's how it, the, those were the origins of America. See, You won't find that in most history books, but I know the truth. So, um, so the, the Swiss then cook eggs differently. So my mother fried eggs. She always fried the eggs. Every once in a while, she would scramble the eggs a little bit, but we always knew that that was just to kind of stretch our horizons, you know, keep us flexible. But tomorrow morning, she'd fry eggs again. And she did, and it was good. It was fine. Mom was great. She never poached the eggs. Not once in 18 years did she ever poach the eggs. So what was I to think when I saw that? By the way, when I saw those, those poached eggs at the end of the table, you could look in them and you could see your reflection. You could comb your hair in the egg or whatever you want. That's not the way you make eggs. That's, that's, just, that's just, if it's not silly, it's wrong. Okay. So I responded in a very Swiss, German kind of way. Okay, I did. All right. Uh, the result in action was poached. What I was hoping for and the, re the feedback. Frustration, yeah, <laughs> exactly. What I, the feedback is what came out of here. So poached eggs, and it was the source of my frustration. That's for sure. So here we are. Uh, there's the reality of the situation. Now I want to go a little bit further, and then we'll take a few minutes break. Of these, the speaker, the message, the hearer, the frame of reference, result in action, uh, desired action, and feedback. Which is the most important, would you say? Feedback. Why is feedback more important in your uh, way of thinking? I believe that feedback is the most important because your wife wanted to do something good for you. And uh, the breakfast was just the, the way to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of, of understanding her, her motivation that she was trying hard to please me. 
and, and to do the right thing at breakfast time. So that would be that would be a good argument for that the importance of feedback. What about any other thought? The most important part of this. No other opinions? Okay, let's try. Well, it really depends on what you're looking for. If it's um, for the interpretation purposes, then the frame of reference becomes very important. Mm -hmm. um, if as a source of change and solving the problem, yeah, the feedback is important. Um, so it's hard to say what exactly you want to put significance on in what situation. Well, you make a point, and the, the point is that all of these are important. Oh, and they're important at different points in the conversation, different points in terms of discussion and understanding. So frame of reference is critical in terms of how we speak and how we interpret and what our expectations are. But it's also important how we handle feedback because either we can change as a result so that how would I change given this feedback now. So my wife says tomorrow morning, what would you like for breakfast? How would I change? What's something I could do differently? Say fried eggs, exactly, yeah. But now all of you think that I'm the one who was wrong here. I know you think that because I see it on your face. Now I have a question for you. Why didn't my wife ask, how would you like your eggs cooked? See, maybe this is as much her fault as my fault. I think she didn't ask you because she didn't want to hear the truth <laughs> from your point of view. Oh. It would upset her. Mm -hmm. Possibly. <laughs> but maybe she just assumed. See, when I said eggs, I assumed she would know because of my background. Nobody poached their eggs. She assumed something different because nobody fried the eggs very much. They all poached the eggs. So we were making, I would say, innocent assumptions. But they were assumptions that we didn't even know we were making. We just said it, she just heard it, and we just thought it would be okay because we didn't clarify our assumptions. So all of these actually are quite important to us. When we come back in a few minutes, uh, we're going to investigate these a little bit more carefully because we need to understand them. And if we understand this basic model of communication, even if we're talking with our spouse or if we're talking with our children or our parents or grandparents or the colleagues in the office or our friends, it doesn't matter. This is always going on. The more we understand the details of this and the more it enters into our thinking, as we're communicating together, the better our communication will be. It will be more accurate. Uh, it'll be less conflict, less misunderstanding, less misinterpretation, less frustration, and everybody will end up being happier. So we'll take a break now. <laughs>